Good morning, class. Today we're taking a look at uh, primary productivity, and we've got a couple definitions that we want to go over. The first one is autotrophic. Uh, so auto, you know, basically autonomous, you're doing it yourself. Uh, troph is nutrition. So these are organisms that can take energy from the sun uh, and they can make their own nutrition. So you've got different plants, different bacteria. In the last video lecture, we talked about plankton, which is probably the biggest group of those organisms in the ocean, can make their own food. Similarly, you are giving them the name a primary producer because ultimately they are producing food for down the, um, the ecosystem train. You've got food webs that are all based off of these initial autotrophs or primary producers. With that said, we've got to quick take a look at how they do this. And maybe you remember back to your high school biology uh, and the concept of photosynthesis. But let's go through photosynthesis. You need two primary things for, photosynth for photosynthetic organisms to do their job. Uh, the first is water, uh, and then the second is carbon dioxide. Well, that carbon dioxide in the ocean is just hanging out there, being available to grab up by those plants. Then those organisms will create a complex sugar, uh, and then it will give off oxygen. So this is sort of a cyclic process, right? And then you've got other organisms that actually do the eating, and so they need the sugar and the oxygen, and then they're going to give off carbon dioxide and that process is called respiration. So some of the other things, if you look on the very bottom that are needed, again, light energy um, and different pigments, uh, probably the most common is chlorophyll, will then help that process out. But I just needed to begin with that and uh, let's take a look at some of the examples in the ocean. So again, I mentioned that plankton uh, and plants uh, typically, use chlorophyll and you can have satellites that will then um, detect that chlorophyll in the water. Now we've got two pictures that are snapshots of how much chlorophyll is in the water. And again, chlorophyll equals productivity. The more chlorophyll in the water, the more plants are in the water and the more that they are growing. So you can see in the top picture is labeled summertime and then on the bottom picture uh, is labeled winter. You can see there's a big transition from a lot of red uh, in the northern hemisphere and then a lot more red in the southern hemisphere. So in other words, productivity is concentrated, one, in our polar regions. But if you look carefully, you can see that over here on the coastline and on the coastline over here along our west coast, you have more productivity on coastlines as well. So where is the productivity concentrated? In polar regions when there's a lot of sun, uh, and then coastlines uh, for a good portion of the years. I know this is somewhat of a complex diagram, but I'm gonna try to go through it. Whenever there's something complex, you just sort of break it down into sections, and you go through it and you try to understand it. So let's look on the bottom first. So we've got this picture of the ocean. We've got the sun, and it looks like the angle of the energy uh, is bouncing off of the sun. We've got the depth of the water, and then we've got the date, and then we have if there's nutrients, uh, and then how much sunlight. So we'll go through each one. We'll start with winter. In the winter season, you have low sunlight, and that's the sun angle is low. In the winter, you also have the highest nutrient count. So there's more nutrients that are in the water. Now as we're moving towards spring, one, the sun is getting higher, so the angle is getting better, and so the sunlight is increasing. The nutrients are starting to go down, but you're going to definitely have, and if we jump up to the top here, you're going to have a tremendous amount of growth of plankton in your spring because, again, you have more sunlight and you have one of the higher nutrient counts. As we go towards summer, you can see that the sunlight is the highest. But unfortunately, the nutrients are the lowest. So you're gonna see these blooms. And again, on the very top, you've got sunlight in this one, up and then down. You've got nutrients, and you can see that it closely relates to the initial growth of the phytoplankton. So the 
phytoplankton actually take the nutrients out of the water. And so they go down. Now, once those, and we're looking again up here, oops, sorry about that. Uh, once we're looking at the top here, you've got your phytoplankton and they've now started to go down, but then you have your zooplankton that begin to go up because the zooplankton are eating the phytoplankton. We go back to the fall. Now we've got the sunlight going down, uh, but you've got your nutrients going up. So then in the fall, you can also have a bloom of organisms, uh, plankton organisms, because again, whenever nutrients go up, there is the possibility for plankton growth. But you also need sunlight. So the more sunlight, uh, the more plankton growth. So even though it's a, somewhat of a complex uh, diagram, it does give us a tremendous amount of information to work with productivity. Let's go over a couple of different examples of uh, these different organisms. The first one are the autotrophs. So the primary autotrophs you see in Southern California are your brown algae. You can see algae in all different colors, green and red and brown. You've got small different uh, plankton called diatoms and dinoflagellites, and you've got something called cyanobacteria. But what's pictured here is your classic kelp. And kelp is a brown algae. It grows off of uh, all of California and the West Coast, and it provides one of the biggest ecosystems um, for organisms and fish to live off of our coastlines. Again, we're gonna just continue to develop a couple different uh, terms. And so again, we talked about producers already, and we've talked about uh, plankton. Now again, when the plankton is doing photosynthesis, they call them phytoplankton. Now that is starting to be stored in the leaves, that energy, and then it's gonna get passed. And so then organisms that eat producers are called consumers. And then once they begin to die, those organisms decompose. So just a little bit about the cycle of life in the ocean. So you've got primary productivity uh, are the autotrophs. And then the secondary productivity are called heterotrophs. They are going to go and find food to eat. Now you've got three different classes of these. You've got your primary consumers. And so you could consider them herbivores that are eating the plants of the ocean. You've got your secondary consumers, which are organisms that eat other animals. And so you would consider those carnivores. And then you've got all kinds of organisms that break down uh, and put nutrients back into the ecosystem. So the fungal organisms and the bacteria that are breaking down this dead um, floatsome material. Our next term is what we're going to call a trophic pyramid. So again, a feeding pyramid. And each of those sizes of the pyramid, so there's more organisms in each part of the pyramid. So the phytoplankton are your largest, and again, the term would be biomass of the ocean. And then the small zooplankton eat the phytoplankton. And then your larger zooplankton would eat the smaller zooplankton. Your smaller fish eat the larger zooplankton. Your large fish eat the smaller fish, and then your biggest fish eat the smaller fish. Now, obviously, it's just a way of sort of classifying an ecosystem so that you can look at some data. Yes, the large tuna could eat some small fish, uh, or a large zooplankton could eat some phytoplankton, but it just puts them into their individual trophic levels. Now, what's interesting about trophic levels is that the energy is passed and you can actually calculate the efficiency. So efficiency is a percent of the energy that is passed from one trophic level to the next. So if you look at the math on the bottom and you have to do a little math uh, if you're in the lecture course, the 10% um, you just multiply by how much of it you have. And then you do that for each particular level. So at this bottom level here, you have 100 kilograms of plankton. The efficiency is 10%. So you have 1,000 multiplied by 0.1 or 10% turns into 100 kilograms. Uh, pardon backyard noise uh, as I'm filming this in the backyard today. And then you have 100 kilograms here. You multiply again by our efficiency of 10%. Now you have 10 kilograms. So by the time that gets to the person, you now have one kilogram of weight gain. So that is called transfer efficiency. 
as you look here, the one of the larger um, losses is between the energy of the sun and the plankton, only 2% efficient. But again, um, that's a lot of energy that's coming, and then uh, you have a, a tremendous amount of plankton, but it definitely can't take in all the energy. So then again, using the 10% efficiency, another way of looking at it is 90% loss. So you've got your first trophic level, and you've got just units to describe it. Again, they're describing a 10% efficiency. So how would you do that if it was a 12% efficiency? Well, instead of multiplying by 0.1, you would multiply by 0.12 for the 12%. Now, if you think about it, you're a large whale, um, and you need a lot of food. So you're gonna probably skip and go down trophic levels because there's more food for you um, and that would be a better use of your energy uh, to get a lot of food because you have an extremely large body type. So our last two uh, ideas that I want to talk about are the ideas of now taking that ecological uh, trophic level and talking about what organisms feed on other organisms and to do that oceanographers take a look at food webs uh, and food chains. So the food web is what you see over here on this side. So we've got the North Sea food web. There's a tremendous amount of organisms and you can see by the arrows, its movement is showing you which organisms uh, are eating what other organisms. So the area, the arrows go from uh, what is eaten to the eater. You can also break that into different simpler chains, and this would be considered a food chain, from the diatom to the copepod to the herring. So the copepod eats the diatom, and the herring eats the copepod. So those are just a couple of definitions uh, that we were taking a look at today, and I hope you guys have a good day.